Good day, Baron B. Barnabas here, taking you on a tour of the Family Polar Exhibition. We Barnabases have spent generations collecting memorabilia from our Arctic expeditions, and we've built this beautiful museum. Now we're not into icy receptions here, so grab a hot cup of cocoa, slip on those complimentary slippers, as we take a journey through man's discovery, fascination and struggle with surviving in this beautiful yet perilous part of the world. The Arctic remains one of the last great wildernesses on our planet, where man and nature have coexisted for thousands of years, but increasingly this existence is out of balance and in collapse. Things are changing. The insurmountable mounted, the wild tamed, the ice is melting. This is the conquest of the Arctic. Far from being barren and empty lands to be charted and claimed, various native groups have lived in the Arctic for millennia. Approximately 11,500 years ago, the most recent ice age came to an end, marking the beginning of the Holocene and the modern human era. As the ice retreated north back towards the polar regions, Homo sapiens, who had been previously confined to the lower latitudes, were able to migrate following the ice, with some of the earliest settlers reaching the Arctic Circle by approximately 5000 BCE. Survival in this unforgiving terrain required a mastery of the environment, and the use of specialist tools to feed and clothe early human settlers. One of these tools in our museum, the Ulu knife, a triangular knife used by the Inuit women of Baffin Island for primarily skinning animals and preparing meat. These knives would often be passed from generation to generation, this was the key to Paleo-Inuit survival, the ability to pass both tools, oral history and knowledge through the generations. Indigenous populations used this knowledge of the extreme climactic conditions to adapt and thrive, even hunting local fauna as large as whales. From 600 to 300 BCE, Greek philosophers theorised of a spherical earth with the polar regions. Although no primary sources survive from the time, we know about the voyages of Pythias of Massalia, who sailed to northwestern Europe around 325 BCE. In his account, he describes a land of perpetual snow and the first written record of the Arctic midnight sun. Central to our display is Gerard Mercator's map, Polus Arteus, from 1595. Drawn from existing maps, journeys of English explorers, and Mercator's theories on the location of the magnetic North Pole. Cartography is a fantastic way to capture a snapshot into the societal and economic interests of the time, as well as the biases of the cartographer. The age of discovery began as European nations competed to explore, exploit, and expand. The story of the Americas from this era may hint at what is at stake for the Arctic in the future. Next in our display, you can see an arctic sledge used in an attempt to reach the North Pole. It's inspiring to think of the bravery and resourcefulness of the original attempts, with many lives lost to the cold. There are many disputed first to reach the North Pole claims. The first scientifically verified trip to the North Pole was completed in 1926 by Roald Amundsen in the airship Norge. Roald claimed many firsts being the first to reach the South Pole in 1911, and the first to traverse the Northwest Passage over the Americas in 1903, taking three years to complete the journey. Next in our exhibition, we have this ice core. The Arctic, in many ways, acts as a planetary barometer and a unique time capsule for our atmospheric past. This Dome C core sample from the Antarctic enables us to see layers of snow from 800,000 years ago allowing us to reconstruct temperatures and atmospheric carbon dioxide levels over this time period. And then we get to the Keeling Curve. Starting in 1958, it shows the rise and rise of atmospheric CO2 to its current level of over 400 parts per million, higher than any level over the last 800,000 years. Let's have a look at what that's done to the Arctic over this time. Of course, the consequence for all this additional CO2 is global warming, which will lead to a potential ice-free Arctic summer by 2050, which of course is an ecological catastrophe for any wildlife that calls this place home. It's interesting to note that through antiquity it is us humans who have appeared vulnerable against the Arctic, 
but now the Arctic appears vulnerable against us. Since Roald Amundsen's voyage through the Northwest Passage, it has become increasingly viable to use us as an alternative to travelling around Cape Horn or the Panama Canal. Generally, the Arctic passages have been too shallow or covered in ice for commercial vessels. Previously, only ships with strengthened hulls or ones accompanied by icebreakers could make the journey. In the Northwest Passage, the MS Nordic Orion pioneered through carrying 25% more cargo than normal, as the Panama Canal is too shallow for such loads. This shaved 1,000 nautical miles off its usual route. In Russia, the Northern Passage is being increasingly used by giant new Venta Maersk class cargo ships, shaving two weeks off its usual journey through the Suez Canal. Given that the 15 largest cargo ships emit more heavy pollutants than all 1.4 billion of the world's road vehicles combined, it is imperative that we move to more environmentally friendly shipping. Despite saving fuel, using the Arctic shipping lanes has its risks. Noise pollution from the increased traffic will disrupt whale hunting grounds, permafrost melting damages the support infrastructure required to service ships and support other industries, and were the worst to happen and there be an oil spill, oil does not break apart as easily in Arctic waters. There are eight countries with territory in the Arctic Circle, and with both the Northern and Northwest Passage lying within the national waters of Russia and Canada respectively, use of these shipping lanes is becoming increasingly contentious. Unlike current international waterways such as the Danish Straits or the Dardanelles, which guarantee free and fair access to any country, both the Arctic routes lie within sovereign waters. Let's say hypothetically Russia didn't get on well with South Korea, it could block or place large tariffs on goods it tries to ship through these waters, instead favouring a political ally like Vietnam. Vietnam therefore in this scenario becomes more economically competitive. Now, imagine that on the scale of China's economy and the Canadian Northwest Passage. The Arctic will be perhaps the most contentious and influential region geopolitically in the next century even though only 4 million people live within the Arctic Circle. The Arctic is cold, remote and difficult to exploit, but global warming is opening it up as a new economic frontier. 13% of the world's undiscovered oil may be within the Arctic Circle, some 90 billion barrels. That's worth over 4 trillion US dollars at the current oil price. Oil exploitation is a game of diminishing returns. Gone are the days of free-flowing Texas oil. Even while the world shifts to renewables, the insatiable appetite for oil drives the technology and the economics of delivery from ever more remote areas and through ever more complex methods. Such as fracking shale rock, Alaskan tar sands, offshore drilling and soon perhaps offshore arctic drilling. It's only a matter of time. Fishing industries may suffer due to global warming too. As the seas warm and the populations of Arctic fish collapse, they may not be replaced like for like with fish from warmer waters. Tourism too. Although currently booming from the increased number of cruise ships coming north, who wants to see an Arctic with no ice? Isn't the appeal of this part of the world that it is so pristine and remote? Arctic ice melt is a positive feedback loop. Melting ice leads to more melting ice as the increased amount of exposed surface water warms it and in turn melts more ice. Our opportunity to slow down or stop this melt is rapidly diminishing and our conquest of the Arctic ice will soon be complete. It will become one of the last wildernesses of the world to be explored mined and sold for its riches. Man may be close to conquering the Arctic, but at what cost? I do hope you have enjoyed your trip around the Barnabas's museum. Please feel free to visit the gift shop where due to freak weather we are having a big summer blowout. Say hi family! Jokes aside, global warming is perhaps the most important issue we face as a species in the coming years. The Barnabas Museum is inspired by the Polar Museum within Cambridge, the United Kingdom. Please do visit and support the worthy causes that they do. There's playlists below in the description for more open-eyed content. Thanks for watching, see you in a moment.